Zdravo svima, moje ime je Danica Banzić i ja sam urednica izdavačke kuće Finesa, a vi gledate 11. epizodu Finesa podcasta. Današnja tema su odrasla deca emocionalno nezrelih roditelja. Inače, knjiga koju je napisala autorka Lindsay Gibson, klinički psiholog i psihoterapeut koji radi već 35 godina, 45 godina ima dugu praksu. Danas smo pričali o svemu, o tome ko su zapravo emocionalno nezreli roditelji, uopšte ne emocionalno nezrele osobe, zašto su oni takvi, šta se to desilo u tim nekim krucijalnim razvojnim fazama pa su zapravo takvi i kako mi možemo zapravo da se ponašamo u njihovom okruženju, a da zaštitimo sebe u celom tom procesu. Više od toga, pričali smo o tome koje su glavne karakteristike, kako da ih prepoznate, kako da se ponašate ako u nekom trenutku zapravo shvatite da se nalazite u vezi bilo kakvoj, da li je partnerskoj, roditeljskoj ili drugoj, sa osobom koja je emocionalno nezrela, ali i više od toga, da li ste vi emocionalno nezreli, kako se ponašate u odnosu na svoju porodicu, na svoje ukućene, na svoje prijatelje i bliske ljude. Gledajte, ovo je zaista jedna prevredna epizoda u kojoj ćete svašta naučiti. So you ask me why do people resonate that much with your book here in Serbia? And um, I was thinking like, okay, living in Balkans generally, like you are living, living actually this book, like emotional immaturity of the parents, of the people, like in your life, okay? So, okay. but then uh, when I got your response, when you actually tell me that you feel it also when we are talking about the government, the culture and everything, that you feel it all or all all over the place. I I start thinking and uh, I wanted to discuss this with you. Can we actually perceive this like um, emotional intelligence and emotional maturity as a spectrum, as a scale? So you can actually move along it, yeah? Even during mm-hmm. the day, even during your lifetime. So uh, is that the case? And how can we actually, how can we actually decide if someone is actually uh emotionally immature is it a uh-huh. parent is it a partner or whoever mm-hmm. yeah well um as i think of it emotional immaturity does fall on a continuum mm-hmm. okay um meaning that some people are extremely emotionally immature and you know other people are you know very emotionally mature and we can fall on that continuum However, I do think there is a kind of uh, pivot point or mm-hmm. um, a dividing line according to, oh, I don't know, five, five or six hallmark characteristics of emotional immaturity. And to my way of thinking, if you fall into those characteristics, all of them, there is some yeah there is something yes all of them there is something qualitatively different Mm -hmm. about the way that you approach life compared to a more uh emotionally mature emotionally integrated person Mm -hmm. so while it's a continuum i think there is a kind of a uh um a defining point Mm -hmm. where if you have these characteristics Mm -hmm. i would consider that you're functioning in an emotionally immature manner most of the time. Now, that said, I want to emphasize that it is also a continuum within each one of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I just mentioned the sort of the overall population, but now we look within and we realize that if we are very tired or sick Mm -hmm. or stressed, our individual emotional maturity goes down. Mm-hmm. I mean, we all know how we act. <laughs> so it depends on the situation, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And 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 it depends on your resource, your internal resources mm-hmm. of the moment. Because when you are, are sick or you're very uh, fatigued, mm-hmm. you may be more short-tempered. You may not be able to think about other people. Mm-hmm. Um, you might become much more egocentric in your approach to life because you don't feel good Mm -hmm. and you just don't have the energy to maintain emotionally mature functioning Mm -hmm. because emotional maturity 
is very psychologically expensive, meaning Mm -hmm. that it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of integration of our, you know, mental, emotional, psychological selves. Mm -hmm. So it's something that requires us to take good care of ourselves Mm -hmm. in order to function in an emotionally mature manner. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're in a situation where there is a lot of environmental um, distress and upset, uh, you know, things are, are not good in the environment, there may be danger, there may be trauma, nobody's going to be functioning at their best. I see. Yeah. Okay. And so that's where you can have situations where being raised in an environment that is very difficult and very threatening can result in people not being able to mm-hmm. function at their best, at their most emotionally mature. Yeah. I see. So, yeah. So there, um, w- would you like me to, uh, just mention the hallmark of characteristic of here. Of course, great. That's great. Okay, I, I think that would fit in. Yeah. Yeah. So emotionally immature people uh, are very egocentric. Mm-hmm. They're very self-focused, self-preoccupied. Everything is about them. Mm-hmm. Every conversation ends up going back to being about them. They have very limited empathy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that they don't have any empathy. Mm-hmm. Because if they're feeling good, things are going their way. They may be very pleasant. They may be attentive to other people for a while. Okay. While but, it's attuned to their emotions yes. and everything. Yeah. Exactly. But when they get even a little bit of stress or a little mm-hmm. bit of fatigue, um, they will regress and will not have empathy for other people. And in fact, they just don't think about what's going on inside other people. Mm -hmm. Another thing that they uh, do characteristically is they, they do not self reflect. Mm -hmm. They never ask themselves, gee, did, did I have something to do Mm -hmm. with this problem? Did Mm -hmm. I cause this by my reaction? They never ask themselves that question Mm -hmm. because for them, it's self-evident that everything is someone else's fault. Mm-hmm. So there's always a lot of blame, a lot of projection, uh, a lot of complaints about how other people are making them miserable or getting in their way. But so, it, is it like with the borderlines, like oh, when they are like uh, able to color the reality with their emotions so i uh, completely adjust the reality to their personal um experience of yes their- that's yes that's the next characteristic mm-hmm. but the, the one about the self-reflection um is important just to pause on for a moment because that has implications for whether or not they're motivated to change mm-hmm. self-reflection is the first step in wanting to change So if I don't look at myself and I'm not curious about my part in my problems, how am I going to change? I I won't see the need for change. Yeah, I see. Just everything will be someone else's fault. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But the next characteristic that you just mentioned would be that kind of um, uh, some researchers, Barrett and Barr, uh, came up with the term affective realism, Mm -hmm. which just means that the emotionally immature person looks at situations through their feelings. Mm -hmm. Uh, Emotion defines, it doesn't just color, it defines the nature of the situation and the nature of reality in their mind. Mm -hmm. So if you did something that they didn't like, or you uh, made a decision that disappointed them, then for them, the reality might be, that you don't love them and you have betrayed them. Mm -hmm. Now that's not at all what's going on, Mm -hmm. but they define reality by how it makes them feel. I see. Okay. So that means that they get into a lot of trouble in their relationships uh, because they end up accusing people of things that are maybe not realistic 
and they make decisions based on their feelings, Mm -hmm. which may or may not be appropriate Mm -hmm. to the situation. I see. So, yeah, so those are just, um, oh, and one other thing, they do have a very characteristic style of relating to other people. Um, they need other people to help them stabilize themselves emotionally. So if you're in a relationship with an emotionally immature person, as far as they're concerned, it's your job to keep them feeling emotionally stabilized, Mm -hmm. feeling good. Okay. And it's also your job to make sure that they have good Mm self-esteem. So you, you are expected to keep them feeling good about themselves. And mm-hmm. that is a very young yeah. kind of uh, orientation toward relationships, just like a little three or four year old. Toddler, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The toddler. Yeah. They, they depend on us to stabilize them emotionally and help them feel good about themselves because they really can't do that all on their own. I see. Only for the toddlers is completely okay to act that way. And yes, you you yes. actually need to be there for them. Absolutely. Yes, because they're in a growth process. They're maturing physically, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so you give them what they need and they grow. Yeah. The problem is with the emotionally immature person, you give them what they demand and it just repeats itself over and over and over again because they're not open to growing, they don't have the self-reflection, and they think they're always right. I see, I see. But when we talk about them, usually, I mean, the narrative is like, we are talking about bad guys. So like, but there, I I was listening to your podcast, I I was reading your books, and uh, you are telling like, they are not necessarily bad people. They are not okay, happy, Uh, they uh, lose the trust along the way. And something happened, uh, for example, during this attachment uh, uh, period. And uh, you actually, you're telling us uh, all along, like, uh, don't judge judge them. They are doing the best they can. They need you. They want you. Okay, it's not that that is actually fair, but we are just talking like we are opening all the cards on the table. We're talking really... uh, 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 honest with each other but um i i wanted actually to uh, to um, uh, do uh, to read this uh, um quote from nikola tesla you heard of him for sure oh, and love, he's serbian guy him. yeah <laughs> of course and he said that when we understand that every opinion is actually a vision um a vision that's loaded with the um, personal history then we will be able actually to understand that all the judgment is a confession so when we are in this is it this is great yeah and it's beautiful <laughs> yeah i see i see and uh, uh i was thinking about them because they're always so so judgy and they're always so yeah they're always demanding and expecting and they're always like expecting you to shape up according to their needs and everything but they're telling us all along something that they were broken that maybe they were abused they were neglected or uh, maybe they had emotionally immature parents right so let's right. talk about them for a bit before we uh, go uh, and talk about what should we do in relation to, to this uh, topic yeah i love that i i mean uh tesla to me is just like one of the most fascinating characters in the history of science or human beings human thought um yeah i've read beyond biographies and things but anyway i i love that because that completely describes what i am trying to communicate that their behavior is driven by involuntary coping mechanisms, Mm -hmm. voluntary psychological defenses that came into being to keep them feeling steady and safe Mm -hmm. as they were growing up. And so, yes, you know, to use the example uh, from earlier, when you have an emotionally mature parent who, when you say, uh, you know, mom, I, I don't want you to do that with my daughter or my son. I want you to do it this way. The mother hears, 
uh, I don't love you and I want you to leave now. Okay, yeah. because that's what it feels like to be corrected. Mm-hmm. So that, according to Tesla, would be the mother's confession yeah. that I could never do anything right with my parent. And I was always being rejected as not being smart enough or good enough uh, to be included in the family. Yeah. And isn't that tragic? I mean, but it's a way of understanding that, yes, the emotionally immature person is helpless really before their defenses they yeah. there's nothing that they can do about it until they start asking themselves some questions about mm-hmm. their functioning and that's where that self reflection comes in as a as a way to help them change so if we have a listener so someone who actually uh likes this book and com- the topic so if if they actually recognize themselves but on the other line of this conversation like being the immature uh emotionally immature so just the state of realizing that you are probably emotionally immature is a great moment like you are you, it's the starting point so it's actually good yeah so what oh, would you what would you say if someone is listening at this moment and start like uh, recognizing uh, the patterns of the behavior and everything and start uh, actually questioning himself what would you say Yeah well first of all I bet everybody listening is going to have that reaction at, le- at least that's been my <laughs> experience where people yeah. when they really love the idea and they really think about it they say to themselves oh my gosh there was that time i i said that to yeah. my child or yeah. uh oh there was a time when i lost my temper and you know uh maybe i'm emotionally immature and maybe i'm damaging my children so you can have moments of emotional immaturity because we all get tired and sick and stressed yeah. right so we have to uh forgive ourselves for that and also we know if we have some emotional maturity how to make amends how to repair how to apologize mm-hmm. i mean it's not that we have to be perfect mm-hmm. because we do have these ways of making things right again mm-hmm. with other people if we will self reflect if we will take accountability for how we treat people so that that would be the person who is not really technically emotionally immature yeah but they judge themselves that way mm-hmm. but for the person who maybe they've gotten feedback uh from their adult children say uh or maybe it's a spouse who's whose husband or wife has said to them you know you are behaving in these ways mm-hmm. and i want you to look at this book and you know and they start to say yeah i guess i do do that mm-hmm. it's a very um it's a very important thing for those people to take it slow mm-hmm. and just admit that they have some things to work on mm-hmm. and trust that someone can help them with that mm-hmm. you know it's like uh i couldn't really um you know uh do a good job of of combing my hair in the morning unless i had a mirror mm-hmm. so I so we need other people to give us feedback yeah and the emotionally immature person needs the feedback but they need to be also gentle with themselves that this mm-hmm. is a a uh, process of learning mm-hmm. and it can be you know it can be scary because you've never done it before mm-hmm. but if you want to change if the relationship is important to you you can <clears throat> excuse me you can learn new concepts mm-hmm. to follow that will help your relationships uh you know in a big way mm-hmm. that that's great but um when uh you are talking about them usually like they're most they're naturally gravitate toward the people who have this secure attachment style yeah they need them or someone who will or maybe anxious who will starting uh, who will always adapt to their needs and everything and put them ahead of themselves and everything but w- from your practice uh have you seen ever in your practice people like that th- they are both in 
emotionally immature and that uh, they can actually exist in the, in the in the relationship that they can actually I, I adapt to each other because I was thinking to, today about it and but if I'm emotionally immature and my par partner is emotionally immature and we de uh, demand of uh, ourselves like oh put me first no 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 put me first so how it's go I, I mean I, I I cannot imagine like that they that couldn't be the case yeah or do you have them in in your practice well uh, I think that's why we have such a high divorce rate <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> you know uh when you get two emotionally immature people together sooner or later after the um initial attraction and happiness uh they begin like tesla says to uh confess their uh unresolved issues with each other in the form oh, of judging. blaming yeah. the other person mm -hmm. And so then there can become, you know, this um, this power struggle mm -hmm. and this mutual blame that never resolves. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they split up. But what can also happen is that an emotionally immature person and a person who is still not fully emotionally mature, but is really more um more mature than the emotionally yeah. immature person. Mm -hmm. they get together maybe in their early 20s because mm -hmm. i don't know they're in school together or mm -hmm. it's, it, people are saying it's time for you to get married or mm -hmm. and so they form a relationship between people who are at different levels of emotional maturity mm -hmm. Um, those relationships tend to not work very well long term. Mm -hmm. What will happen is that they'll stay together, you know, maybe into their 30s, um, which or, or, or could be much later. But one of the partners has the potential to keep growing. Mm -hmm. okay, so they may meet at a mutually emotionally immature stage of life, which in, in your early 20s, say you're still you know, still pretty young emotionally. Mm -hmm. And if one partner grows and the other partner doesn't, that becomes an incompatible uh, relationship because the partner who's growing will begin to want more emotional intimacy. Uh, that, I'm sorry, that's another characteristic of emotionally immature people. Yeah, they, yeah, just, yeah. they just don't like to get really close yeah, yeah. Uh, or talk about feelings yeah. so that can be a cause for the more mature partner to want to get out of that relationship mm -hmm. but for the stable relationships between say two emotionally immature people um we have to remember that um murray bowen a family therapist um back in the 70s used to say that people of the same uh, maturity level tend to end up together. Mm -hmm. So if you have, uh, you know, two people in a marriage and one person is very emotionally immature, mm -hmm. it's really quite likely that the other partner is too. Mm -hmm. They may be showing it differently. They may be more passive or, or whatever, but it's very likely that if they're staying together, they probably are about the same place on the scale, so to speak. I see. Yeah. I so see. That's, that's what we have to remember is that uh, people don't stay together typically, uh, at least they don't stay together happily when there's a big difference in their maturity. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that sounds reasonable, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so uh, to get back to adult children of uh, emotionally immature parents, uh, many people may not even realize uh, that they had emotionally immature parent until they're well into their uh, adulthood. So mm -hmm. what are the triggers or events that actually uh, bring them to this realization? Mm hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, when you're uh, in your teens and in your 20s, you're, you're uh, by necessity very absorbed in creating your own life as an adult, as, an, as a young adult. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of things to do. There are a lot of 
uh, requirements to fulfill. And so a person may not be ready to reflect on mm-hmm. their childhood or on their on their current relationship with their parents because so much other exciting stuff is going on. I see, yeah. Uh, but once they start to uh, begin to form uh, uh, deep relationships on their own, or they really begin to feel like, hey, I am an adult now. I know my own mind. I have the right to my own life. I'm living in my own apartment now, <laughs> or I'm married. Uh, and then the parent is still treating them as though they're a child, or the parent is still trying to control their decisions. Then it begins to stand out to them mm-hmm. that this is very hard to take. Um, Mm -hmm. This is really unpleasant. Uh, The relationship is not something that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. They really, uh, you know, maybe they don't want to admit it, but, you know, maybe they don't want to spend time with their parent because it makes them feel like, you know, they're back in in their childhood role. Um, And here they've already grown up. Mm -hmm. So, Um, that's one thing. But the other thing is that many times adult children of emotionally immature parents have a lifelong sense of emotional loneliness. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's like the undercurrent that goes on in their lives in a way that, you know, uh, not, not many things touch it. It's a constant sort of feeling and almost an existential feeling about being in the world alone. Mm -hmm. And that comes from, I think, um, that comes from a childhood in which you have a parent that isn't good at making an emotional connection Mm -hmm. with that child, to, to be really attuned sensitively to that child's emotional needs. And so the child grows up feeling like, um, you know, they had they had everything they needed. Their parent took care of them when they were sick. Mm -hmm. They went to school. They had the Uh, roof over their head. Exactly. That's a yes, that's a big one. Had a roof over my head and meals on the table. Yeah. (laughs) I should be fine. (laughs) Thankful and everything. Yes, yes. But if you don't have that emotionally intimate connection where you feel like you can look in your parents eyes and tell that they get you that they know you and that they are receptive to you they're interested they're curious about you they're treating you like you're real inside if you don't get that you i mean i think this is biological it's brain it's it's not not some concept it's it's in our brains that if we don't get that we have a kind of a dysphoria Mm uh you know a a low mood a loneliness that is there underneath because our brains our hearts are not getting what we are designed to need Mm -hmm. yeah i see well isn't that making a fertile ground for the child with this sort of parents to actually become once again emotionally immature? That's a fascinating question. I will let you know when I come up with an answer for that because (laughs) (laughs) uh, because a lot of the people that I work with in psychotherapy or in coaching, to my observation, they are much more emotionally mature than their parent. Yeah. Uh, now that fascinates me. Yeah. It's I like, see. how did that happen? Why did this person develop in such a way that they're not overly egocentric, that they do have empathy, that they do like emotional intimacy? Even though I, the environment was like, like, yes. th- like that, yeah? Yes. And, uh, you know, I I think people who uh, research resilience would say that there were people in that child's environment who did respond to them in that way, who did help them develop their emotional maturity. So that would be, you know, based on research, 
And if we said that emotional maturity is kind of like resilience, we would say Mm -hmm. there probably were people who stepped in and related to that child in such a way that they grew those parts of them that maybe the parent could not help with. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the child might be innately more mm, endowed to use life experiences to become emotionally mature. Mm -hmm. For instance, they could come into this life with more sensitivity and more perceptiveness Mm -hmm. than the average child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they they could pick out emotional nutrients Mm -hmm. in their interactions because they notice them. Mm -hmm. Okay, Um, that would be, uh, you know, another way that they could they could grow up and then I mean, grow up more emotionally mature than their parents. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, a a friend of mine, Tiffany Root, another psychologist, has the idea that the child who grows up more emotionally mature than anyone else in their family has probably been identified at an early age Mm -hmm. as the caretaker Mm -hmm. of the parents. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, and there is some research, there is some evidence Mm -hmm. that when children are parentified Mm -hmm. to function as kind of a third parent, you know, they take care Mm -hmm. of the younger children, Mm -hmm. they make sure everybody gets out of the house in the morning, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they cook dinner, you know, when they're kind of given the message, you are a, a capable, responsible kid, and we depend on you. Yeah something about that that's very strengthening mm-hmm. now they have their problems because yeah, of i see i see yeah, but it's but, like they value the child over this yes and and that sense of being valued yeah. is very strengthening and it forms a kind of a connection that is bringing them the uh the nurturance that they need i see that's the nutrient that you were talking us about like that they're picking from the environment so that would be the one yeah yes exactly i see but talking about the family dynamics it can be really complex so there may be siblings that can perceive the dynamics of the family and uh, they can have different perception and uh, different experiences about the parents about their uh, emotionally immature parents so um how do family roles or uh, a birth order uh, can play into this topic? How can you, how do you see it? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I haven't uh, found necessarily that, uh, you know, that there it's always a certain birth order, but I do notice that a lot of my clients have been the eldest child. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that we get back to what we just discussed that maybe they have been valued Mm -hmm. by the parent as an effective individual child Mm -hmm. um, where the parent gives them feedback that you are uh, smart enough, strong enough, Mm -hmm. wise enough to handle these things I'm making you do. Uh, So that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, But... (sighs) What we what we need to think about is the original nature of the child. I, I broke it down into internalizers and externalizers, mm-hmm. the two you know major types of adult children. Mm-hmm. And the internalizer is the one that has that capacity to process, internalize things, think about them be Mm -hmm. self-reflective, wonder about what things mean, um, try to figure things out. Mm -hmm. They like to learn, they like to process. And maybe that's a factor of intelligence, or maybe it's just a factor of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. But they are, from the very beginning, they tend to think about things. Mm -hmm. Now, that kind of child is probably more sensitive, more perceptive, um, and they will, as as a result, tend to facilitate their own growth mm-hmm. because 
that's how we grow. We Mm -hmm. learn, we process, we change. But the other type of child in these families would be a child uh, that I call an externalizer, Mm -hmm. whom the parent is more enmeshed with. In other words, the parent doesn't Mm -hmm. say, you're the one who has to get your little brother dressed in the morning. In other words, I rely on you. You Mm -hmm. can do it. Mm -hmm. Instead, that parent may get enmeshed emotionally with the child and treat the child as an extension of their own ego. Mm -hmm. Like the child could be treated um, uh, in a very uh, entitled way that the parent overindulges the child, doesn't Mm -hmm. guide the child, just says, you know, you're the most wonderful thing ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or it could be that the parent doesn't encourage the child to become themselves as an individual. Instead, the message is, no, you know, we, you stay at home and take care of your parents. Mm-hmm. You know, that may be a message. Or you, you still keep coming home because you're, you're one of our children. Mm-hmm. And they don't really allow those externalizing children to grow a sense of self. Mm-hmm. So if the, if the child is able to get that feeling that they are an individual with their own life, I think they can, you know, very much go on and and do pretty well in the world. But the child that is the externalizer, they will have very uh, non-productive coping mechanisms Mm -hmm. and their defenses will run along the lines of blaming everybody else for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, this thing fell out of the sky. I had nothing to do with it and landed on my head. And I have no idea mm-hmm, <laughs> because see. they're not curious mm-hmm. and they don't want to learn or process because that's, they, they haven't been asked to do that. It was enough for them to be born their parents' child. Mm-hmm. And that's all they've been encouraged to be. Yes. So how do you develop a self out of that? It's really hard, actually. Yeah. 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 But over a lifetime, do you believe that it can change? Um, I In your book, um, you were talking about uh, the concept of reparenting. It's something that um, I'm familiar with. I love it. I was reading about it from Muriel James and uh, Mary Golding, and I love it. But could you explain what this means and uh, 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 how it can actually help an adult child to reparent. Yeah. Um, are you talking about reparenting in the sense of a type of therapy yeah. or or kind of a self reparenting or both? Yeah, uh, actually, that was uh, my question. What do you prefer? What would you recommend? What is more effective to self reparent or to do it with you, like reparenting with a therapist? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I think uh, if you have a therapist who understands that's what you're doing, I think that is probably the the deepest and the most effective way of reparenting yourself. With a but, therapist, yeah? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, because in that relationship with the therapist, you're going to be reenacting, re-experiencing uh, the feelings and the fears that uh, have come about in your life. And and that therapist will keep pointing you mm-hmm. toward what does that mean? And mm-hmm. uh, what, what did you feel? And what's that about? And why is there anxiety around this issue? Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be able to do that so much with if yourself. You're alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think a combination of your own reading, because it's it helps to get the concept. Mm -hmm. It helps to get the idea that, you know, this is what's going on. But then to work through the feelings and how you deal with feelings and relationships, I think a therapist can be enormously helpful. Mm -hmm. But I will say that if you end up with a therapist who is really strictly looking only at cognitive Mm -hmm. behavioral stuff, okay, 
they're not going to be getting into the emotional areas that I think a person needs to explore. Mm -hmm. Um, because this very much in my mind is associated with parts of the brain Mm -hmm. that are very linked to the emotional centers. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're, I mean, I'm not saying that cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't work and Mm -hmm. isn't successful uh, with a lot of things, but when you're trying to emotionally mature yourself, Mm -hmm. I think you have to have someone who is aware of the emotional components as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, but, um, you were talking again, um, the, uh, the podcast you were in last time I was, uh, listening to it and then you said something, I will quote you. Okay. Uh, I find it really interesting. So I wanted to, uh, listen a bit more about it. So you said all narcissistic personality disorders are emotionally immature, but certainly not all emotionally immature people are narcissistic. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a bit more about it? Because yeah. we we certainly live in an era of narcissism. Yeah, it's all over the place. It comes from from all of the our screens. Yeah, and from telephones, from television, from all over the place, like I said. So and um, many authors these days are pointing that out. For example, Dr. Ramani, Dervasala Ramani, she is talking aloud about it and uh, trying actually to to emphasize that some, some, sometimes how we are victims of some narcissistic persons all over the place. Like so. Uh, and then I was listening to this podcast and you said this, but you didn't go more into this and I wanted to listen a bit more about it. So yeah. how come? Okay, so n- narcissistic person is emotionally mature. Okay, quote. So, but uh, what about em- emotionally immature person does not have to be narcissistic, yeah? Does not to have narcissistic disorder. Right. Yeah, the way I look at it is that emotional immaturity is like an umbrella term mm-hmm. uh, for a lot of different personality styles. Mm-hmm. A lot of, um, yeah, A lot of personality styles is probably a good way to put it Mm -hmm. Um, because you could have uh, if you looked into the the um, diagnostic manual that we use in the United States, you know, there are all these personality disorders Mm -hmm. and so forth. And you could say with with any kind of personality that has ingrained characteristics that are repetitive and maladaptive, Mm -hmm. that that is probably a sign of emotional immaturity, meaning that the person's development psychologically didn't go well Mm -hmm. and they got stuck in certain defensive patterns and self images, et cetera, that really have not been adaptive uh, to adult life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like the term emotional immaturity for working with people because it enables me to discuss these characteristics without calling their parent a name, mm-hmm. you know, I see. <laughs> because, yeah. because if you say, you know, your mother, your mother is uh, a narcissist or mm-hmm. your father is, you know, clearly a mm-hmm. borderline, mm-hmm. Um, you know, we love our parents. We, we take that personally. Uh, we don't like having them diagnosed or, mm-hmm. or called names. We want to understand their behavior. And so I think that's what using that term emotional immaturity does is it helps them to look at their parents' behavior in a certain light without pathologizing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But back to your question about narcissism, narcissism is just one solution to uh, a developmental issue that didn't get solved, Mm -hmm. didn't, uh, didn't go well. Mm -hmm. Okay. You might under different conditions, that person might have developed uh, a borderline personality disorder, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, uh, that person could have, you know, developed some other kind of, uh, personality disorder, but it's a, it's narcissism is a, it's a solution. 
that actually works very well in Western civilization. Mm-hmm. Actually, I shouldn't even say that. I should say it really works well worldwide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> if we can see it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because you have people who, uh, you know, are, they appear to be, you know, extraordinarily self-confident. Mm-hmm. Uh, they always think they're right. And they usually have a fair amount of charisma mm-hmm. because there's something about, it's just like with three-year-olds. I mean, they're mm-hmm. so adorable, you know? <laughs> they just do whatever you they want. You cannot stop looking at them, yeah? <laughs> you cannot stop looking at them. They're so cute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the narcissistic person, uh, you know, tends to get stuck somewhere in there. Uh, and they've probably gotten feedback from a parent that there's something about them that's truly special, mm-hmm. you know? And so they carry that forward. And, you know, there we have our, you know, charismatic leader or dictator or, you know, (laughs) religious leader, whoever, uh, who actually doesn't have a sense of uh, empathy or compassion Mm -hmm. for other people. It's all very self-centered, but uh, but it it can be very attractive on the front end. Yeah, I see. Uh, How actually uh, like living with the um, being actually the adult uh, children of emotionally immature parents how it affects the emotional relationships yeah it has a profound effect um because the adult child of these parents grows up believing that other people's needs and feelings are vastly more important than their own. Uh, They grow up with the belief that uh, they are supposed to meet the needs of these other people, and yet they get the feeling that they can never do enough. And so if the other person is unhappy or dissatisfied, the adult child will tend to take that personally, take that to heart, and feel like it's up to them to work harder. I'm responsible, yeah. I'm responsible, yes. Because emotionally more mature uh, people with these parents will Mm self-reflect. And they'll say, gosh, you know, uh, mom wasn't happy with that. I didn't, apparently I didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what's wrong with me Mm -hmm. that I didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm a selfish person. Maybe Mm -hmm. I'm not able to love in the way that I should be. And that's not the problem at all. Mm -hmm. The problem is that for their emotionally immature parent, love means that you uh completely ignore yourself and give all your attention and energy to me Mm -hmm. because i am the most important person in this relationship Mm -hmm. and that's what the adult child of an emotionally immature parent learns at a very early age and that keeps being reinforced in their interactions with the parent which is you don't matter as much as i do so is and, this, is this the reason why they usually pick up the partner who is such a so similar to their parents Im- immature parents emotionally immature parents yes usually yeah if if they're in a um if the way that they adapt to that parent is to question themselves and then to become increasingly passive meaning that uh they keep trying to make the other person happy or they keep trying to put that other person first yeah then they they end up uh repeating that in their choice of partner another thing that happens is that they're given the message that it is your moral obligation Mm -hmm. to give me what i want yeah even at great even at great cost to yourself yeah like yeah, yeah. You're bad. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. bad if you don't give me what I want when I ask for it. Yeah. And that is so confusing, you know? It's mm-hmm. like the person thinks, well, I I, just, I said no because I, I, you know, there's this other, I, I can't do it. I, I had to say no. But the parent gives them the message, yes, but, you know, if you really loved me, 
and if you were a good person, that's the moral obligation, uh, you would make this happen. You would give me what I want. Exactly. So, uh, about the cultural background, so I need to share this with you. Uh, in February, I had the seminar with Tony White, he's Australian uh, psychotherapist, and uh, uh, we were talking about the uh, redecision. And uh, uh, then we were sharing some examples about from our culture and emotional immaturity. And uh, he was actually so fascinated with the fact that we talk with our parents, for example, at at least for three, four, five times a day per day, that we usually live really near them, like in the same street or two way streets from, from our house. And that they demand all sorts of things uh, from us and that we are actually responding to this. And uh, we do have this obligation, moral obligation, and feel that we need to, if uh, mama calls you 10 times, per day, you need to respond 10 times per day, mm -hmm. even though you have uh, your own family and your own uh, dynamic, you know, so but that, that's the thing. And uh, I saw that he was so surprised that he was like, Oh, my God, is this like only in Serbia? Okay, is this in Balkans? So, because it wasn't the, the case in Australia. So uh, how can cultural sensitivity and awareness be integrated in healing process? Mm -hmm. If you are adult uh, uh, child, a child of uh, emotionally immature parents, mm -hmm. yeah. can it be the fact? Well, yeah, yeah. Th no, that's a really, really good question because, of course, there are cultural differences. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the way I would differentiate that would be if you have the right mm -hmm. to be an individual person. That is, if your parent basically sees you as psychologically real mm -hmm. inside, mm -hmm. like that you have an inner world, that you have a life, that you're an adult, mm -hmm. um, then that ha is the basis for having an emotionally mature relationship with them. Because mm -hmm. they're willing to grant you the right to be yourself and to have your own life. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, in that context, if that's happening, to me, it doesn't matter how many times you call a person during the day. Mm -hmm. You know, like I might call my best friend twice a day mm -hmm. uh, because I have something to tell her or because it's fun or, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm not looking at it like, like I can't live without her advice. I'm looking at it like I just thought of something. I want to share it with yeah, her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but if the parent is calling 10 times a day and gets very upset when the child says, uh, mom, I'm, I'm in the middle something. of something, yeah, yeah. uh, can I call you back? Or mom, I can't talk right now. I'm getting ready to get in the car to, to pick up somebody. If the mother <sighs> makes the person feel like they're being uh, morally bad or that they're being unloving, that's where you get into uh, signs that the relationship is based on this emotionally immature contract mm -hmm. that you're supposed to be there to help me maintain my emotional equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That's a reversal of roles. Um, and it's something that most people don't enjoy being on the receiving end of. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, it would be, we can have all kinds of cultural differences, mm -hmm. but if, uh, for instance, I, uh, I was watching a, um, there's a uh, documentary now on David Beckham, the, the soccer player. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and his mother at one point says, what are you going to do? He's an adult. And I thought, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> she recognized that he had the right to make decisions about his life, even if she thought it was a bad idea. Mm-hmm. And that's the emotional maturity. I grant you the respect for having become an adult and having your own life. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not in the number of phone calls. It's not how close you live to someone. It has to do with, are you able to be both close and honest with each other about your feelings and needs and to um, maintain 
a sense of individuality and have that be respected both ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, as a closing question or two, uh, if somebody listens to this and uh, recognize uh, herself or uh, himself, like uh, that they have a emotionally immature partner or parent, so what would you uh, actually recommend to them? What what would be your first advice? Like, okay, you were listening to this, you suspected something, and then now you realize that your partner or parent has like everything checked, like that, check, 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 mm-hmm. everything is checked. So what would you say? I, I remember one time that uh, uh, you said like, uh, observe, start observing like how they actually uh, connect with you, how they treat you, etc. But w- 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 what would you say now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that would be the first step. Yeah, observation. Uh, it, yes, observation. But I think um, even maybe before that, for instance, let's say that a person was walking through the bookstore or maybe they were uh, online and and they came across a book yeah. such as mine mm-hmm. that had an idea that spoke to them. Mm-hmm. And then they start reading mm-hmm. and and they get the concept, oh, this is a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I can learn about this. I can understand this. Then they are in a position to go back with that information, with those concepts into their relationship and observe whether or not this person in their life is behaving in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's it's kind of like uh, you have to observe, but you also have to have the idea of what you're observing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Otherwise, you know, if you, (laughs) you don't know what you're trying to pick out. It would be confusing. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh when the person observes and and they detach mm-hmm. from the emotional uh reactivity of the other person mm-hmm. in other words mom gets upset because i didn't want to take her call mm-hmm. after five calls <coughs> excuse me yeah so if mom gets upset because she doesn't because i don't take her call then you would pull back instead of you getting reactive Mm -hmm. and say, Oh, I'm so sorry. Or getting angry. Like, well, what Mm -hmm. are you talking about? I Mm -hmm. took your first four calls, whatever your reactivity might be to step back and detach from reacting to them so that you can just look at the dynamic. Like, uh, wait a minute, I'm not being given the right to protect my own time Mm -hmm. and my own adult responsibilities because Mm -hmm. mom wants to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm observing that that's happening. What does that mean? And then do I like that? How do I feel about that? Mm -hmm. So you're not only detaching from your reactivity to the emotionally immature person, but you are you are tuning in and connecting with what that is like for you. Mm-hmm. And you might feel, oh, that's making me feel shut down. That makes me feel small. That makes me feel afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, and you begin to realize that, oh, I'm in a relationship with a person who is emotionally coercing me to feel guilty or ashamed or doubt myself or even feel fear. That's Mm -hmm. the kind of relationship that this feels like, Mm -hmm. okay, which is what happens with emotionally mature people. Um, And then from there, you can decide, you know, what you want to do about that. Mm -hmm. But it's a combination of both observing the emotionally immature behavior in the other person and developing enough of a connection, uh, a, a knowing of yourself Mm-hmm. and who you are and what you need mm-hmm. so that you build your sense of self and your sense of individuality and worth, okay? 
And then we see how it develops. We're going to see what happens uh, if you take care of yourself, stay connected to yourself, mm -hmm. and begin to really question whether or not this person has the right to make you feel bad or to control you. Mm -hmm. So that those would be the uh, you know those would be the steps if you just began to to realize that this might be going on. It's to, to learn about what it is, to notice it, to observe it, and then to tune into its effect on you and whether or not this is good for you and whether or not you need to do something different in terms of how you respond to it. Because maybe it's not a good idea to keep accepting the phone calls mm -hmm. when inside it's really making you feel angry mm -hmm. or frustrated. Anxious, yeah, I see. Maybe you want to try a different response and see what happens. Because when you begin to be more assertive about your own needs, yes, the relationship, you know, has to change. It it hopefully will mature. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not. I mean, if the person gets very upset with you. Uh, but you are no longer agreeing to, you know, uh, shrink yourself in order to have the relationship. That That's not a good deal. So I believe that you need to load yourself up with a lot of self-compassion. So, and, yes. okay, yes. self-compassion at the Thank first you. place. And then you can actually move along and do do the thing that you actually now recommended. Okay. Uh, so the last two questions are uh, personal in a way that I wanted to ask you who inspired this. This is something that we do usually at the end of the the, the podcast. So who uh, uh, who was uh, inspiring you lately, for example? I don't know, can you pick a person? It doesn't have to be someone from your family or your neighborhood or among your friends. It can be someone, some celebrity person or whoever. Is there someone who actually inspired you, I don't know, this week? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, that person would be Ian McGilchrist. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a Scottish psychiatrist and philosopher and well you name it he's a kind of a polymath mm -hmm. <laughs> his breadth of of knowledge is is incredible but he has a book called um the master and his emissary mm -hmm. and it's about right and left hemisphere brain functioning mm -hmm. uh and how that affects the way that we live our lives mm -hmm. it, it absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. uh i've always been interested in his work since 2009 mm -hmm. but recently i've just completed one of his uh other um it's like a huge two volume mm -hmm. <laughs> set it's just fascinating because it dovetails with a lot of the information in my book about emotional immaturity mm -hmm. and his premise is that uh well this is what i'm inferring mm -hmm. that actually emotionally immature people are focusing on one part of their brain mm -hmm. the left side of the brain mm -hmm. to the exclusion of their emotional awareness mm -hmm. which tends to be more in the right hemisphere mm -hmm. and this has really uh dire effects not only on the children of those mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. but when it becomes more of a uh approach of civilization where industry technology social media you know these things that are very mechanized mm -hmm. become more important than our connections with ourselves and with each other mm -hmm. and his his uh, descriptions and arguments for that are to me just fascinating Oh, great. So I, I guess that the next question uh, question will rely on, on this one. What are you reading these days? But I guess <laughs> that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, actually, but uh, I'll tell you the, the latest book that, that came to me this morning yeah. uh, from Amazon. Uh -huh. And it's called the Oxford 
what is it? The Oxford Book of Psychology and Spirituality. Ooh, yeah, and is by that Lisa. Something new? Yes, it's yeah. uh, edited by Lisa Miller, mm-hmm. and she is a, a PhD psychologist who's. I don't know. She's published like you know over fifty articles on mm-hmm. spirituality, uh, no, on the mental health benefits mm-hmm. of spirituality. Of spirituality. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so I'm really looking forward to diving into that because I think that all of this helps to put us in touch with these deeper parts of ourselves, mm-hmm. whatever that is, mm-hmm. and it does have this quality of enlarging our our sense of self and our uh, sense of well-being in the mm-hmm. world uh, when you can combine those things instead yeah. of being so, uh, you know, mechanistic and logical yeah. about it. I see. I see. Okay. So have you seen your book, the cover of it in Serbian? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, Thank it you. It is. It is. It's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Lindsay, thank you so so much. I hope that you will visit us in Belgrade. So uh, we will bring you to, we will take you to Museum of Nikola Tesla, and oh. uh, yeah, we will make a tour. And uh, <laughs> please don't forget my my proposal for for the seminar. I, I I think people would love to hear much much more about this. So think about it. We will. Uh, email each other and stay in contact okay thank that you sounds so wonderful. much thank you for having me no. take care okay you too bye bye